you put your hand up and when you ask your question, uh, tell us who you are and make your question brief. Hi, um, hi, I'm Devin. I'm a, a master's neuroscience student here. Um, my question is, what would you propose as the evolutionary significance of feeling compassion towards others? And is a feeling of compassion mediated by oxytocin or really similar to attachment? I'm hesitating just a little bit because there's actually a good bit of discussion these days about what compassion means. So I'll start with empathy. Um, empathy is the ability to feel what somebody else is feeling. Uh, that has evident evolutionary uh, advantages, especially in a mammalian species where parents need to care for the needs of, of offspring. So it's believed that this empathic uh, capacity emerged in that context. It does appear to be very much mediated by oxytocin. And in fact, recent work on not the molecule itself of oxytocin, but the gene that codes for the receptor site in the human brain, that has uh, a number of different polymorphisms or different forms. Uh, and a number of those forms are uh, correlated with either increased empathy, or in some cases, actually decreased empathy and location on the Asperger's uh, condition. So for sure that. Now the, the next question, um, well, compassion, some people view as the next step um, from empathy. Empathy in itself is, is value neutral. You could use empathy to be a good torturer. What it involves is feeling what somebody else is feeling, and then you could use it to manipulate or even injure them. Most folks think that compassion is the next step of feeling with or feeling for somebody, where you actually use empathy uh, and use it to inform regard for their welfare. Uh, my own view is that there's a biological substrate there, uh, empathy, but whether or not we take it to the stage of compassion, theologians sometimes refer to as compassionate love, is um, culturally and values mediated. And by the way, um, we can make changes. So there are <coughs> historical changes and, and personal changes where we rule somebody out out of compassionate care, due to prejudice or bias, uh, and through self-critical moral evaluation, um, we let them in. Jesus says, love your neighbor, uh, but the thing is, uh, we can expand who's in the neighborhood and who receives our compassionate regard. Commander Patrick Grimes, I wonder if you've considered thinking about the Indian population and what they would think about it. Uh, the Hindus in the the Hindus in particular, because they believe in reincarnation and karma. And if you believe in reincarnation and karma, you must believe that there is somebody who ensouls this planet. And uh, that would have some bearing on where they are reincarnated, possibly into their own old families several generations ago. Have you thought about that impact on the old subject? Uh, I shared a couple of books with you uh, by Art and Orange Zion, Big Gods, and uh, Don Johnson's God is Watching You. Um, actually, both of these individuals and a number of other workers have, um, that's kind of a catchy title, uh, but they've actually gone beyond that to look at afterlife beliefs in general. Uh, so it could be resurrection and facing divine judgment, it could be reincarnation, uh, it could be ghosts as, as ancestors. Uh, what they uh, found is a, a large cross-cultural um, survey of afterlife after beliefs. Um, those beliefs that, that um, link afterlife fate uh, with social decisions or morality in this life uh, have uh, simultaneously uh, are associated with different attitudes uh, toward uh, social cooperation and actually different scales of so social cooperation.
can I make a very light comment? It seems to me that if you're in reincarnation, then epigenetics is highly important because the life experiences determine where you go next. And epigenetics is certainly part of that. Well, if, uh, if you believe in uh, reincarnation, oh well, let's see, then, um, then heritable aspects relating to life decisions here um, have to be very important. It's not clear that epigenetics would be, uh, as at least as standardly posited, because that's a material process. It involves uh, changes in the substrate of, of DNA. So it's not clear that that would be inherited in a next life uh, that is uh, desegregated from, or segregated from our current. There's some sort of epigenetics really just means above or aside uh, the genes, if there's some sort of epigenetic inheritance that was non-material, mm, then maybe. Mr. Stevenson, the philosopher. Um, can we look on the dark side for a moment? War and genocide are distinctly human activities, as far as I know, know what animal goes into them. They both involve cooperation on quite a large scale. So would you agree cooperation is very, human cooperation is very ambivalent? Um, absolutely. So I don't know if you heard the question, but war and genocide are distinctly human. Uh, a couple of comments there. The scale of war and genocide seem to be distinctively human. Uh, this notion of intergroup conflict is, is actually not. Um, and there's, in, in primates, there's a lot of intergroup conflict uh, that involves uh, warfare, uh, actually. It's just that the, the group compositions are smaller in scale. Uh, for humans, uh, war and genocide is amplified by culture and uh, cultural and technological developments. But you're right. Um, war and genocide itself, um, terrorism, uh, while viewed by those against whom it's perpetrated as extremely antisocial, uh, often involves tremendous uh, in-group solidarity. In fact, I mentioned uh, my colleague David Sloan Wilson uh, before. He, he, he argues, uh, a number of my uh, colleagues do, uh, that there, in addition to individual selection for individual reproductive success, and Darwin himself uh, uh, explored this, that there is a selection for cooperation at the group scale that might even involve uh, relinquishment of individual fitness um, for an individual in my group, uh, as long as the average fitness within the group is higher than the fitness of groups without that scale of cooperation. But David says the dark side of group selection and group commitment is intergroup hostility. Uh, so we're sure that's the case, uh, that intense uh, love for and even sacrifice on behalf of my neighbor can and often does involve hostility to my non-neighbor. And here's the question. I mean, it's an interesting scientific question, but a crucial global question. We've seen across the course of human history an expansion of neighborhood. Um, so how far can we expand it? Uh, by both moral uh, and religious values. Love your neighbor. Uh, we can expand the neighborhood. The call of uh, the seemingly impossible call of the Gospels and the Christian tradition, by the way, is not only to expand the neighborhood, but to love those who aren't in the neighborhood. To love your, love your enemy. We see vanishingly little of that, uh, but that's the distinctive call, which, which may involve uh, something beyond our biological resources. I can't lay the definition of what you see, but uh, given those are the standards. Um, one could make a, a distinction between um, recognizing some um, purpose or meaning for all of life, or recognizing for an individual, individual human being. Uh, 
Uh, it seems to me a lot of your argument is consistent with you making a case for um, an explanation for, for meaning across the whole life, across life as, as a whole. Um, do you have something to say about whether individual human beings have meaning to their lives? Can you, can you stretch your argument to that? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. So uh, I want to make two comments, and I know we're close to time. Um, first of all, um, the enterprise of natural theology attempts to infer um, the existence of God or uh, the uh, existence of, of a meaning to life um, from observations of the natural world. I actually um, was not attempting to do that. I think some people do do that. Uh, my main attempt uh, here was to argue against the nihilistic proposition that we can do, in a sense, the inverse of natural theology, which is make natural atheology, suggesting that if we look at the world, it's not only consonant with, but demonstrative of there being no purpose. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's a warranted conclusion. I don't, however, believe that from the workings of the natural world, we can infer a particular purpose. It does look consonant with the idea of increasing neighborhood, actually. That what we see over the uh, history of major evolutionary transitions is this principle, I don't mean to be glib here, but this principle that you gain life by laying it down. At every, at every stage, there's more biotic, uh, to use Hans Jonas's phrase, more, more biotic potency by giving up a degree of, of your autonomy. That's, uh, so that's number one. Number two, well, how about human life? Boy, it has been uh, really unfashionable to the point of being heretical uh, in evolutionary biology and in intellectual culture uh, for the last several generations to argue that there's anything exceptional about human beings. But I actually think there is. Uh, and some of the quotes I shared with you, Ernst Baer's notion that we're a spectacular outlier. Now, one question there in terms of being an outlier, uh, you can be uh, an outlier with respect to being completely off the line, or you can be an outlier in the sense of being uh, a wild extrapolation from the line. And I think we're the latter. In a sense, uh, it may sound either heretical or simplistic, but uh, in, in the sense of uh, our capacity for uh, intersubjective commitment uh, and attachment, I think we're a culmination of the evolutionary process. And to answer specifically your question, I think the human, uh, the telos of human existence is to love one another and to love one another with um, radical unselfishness. Uh, in a way that may seem uh, counterintuitive or impossible, but which ironically uh, results in uh, much more profound human, uh, aware, uh, experience of human flourishing. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for a wonderful lecture. You've, uh, you've certainly given us a huge amount of information about the nature of what's going on inside us when we're unselfish and when we love and so on, but but clearly the most important thing for us is to uh, is not to ponder the, what, the biology of what's happening, but to really practice practice love and, and, and altruism. Um, it was interesting that this afternoon we we went into St. Leonard's School, and the kinds of questions that they asked were very different. They were much more interested in. Um, the effect of mobile phones on, on, on love and on, on, on dating apps. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but thank you so much. Um, and uh, could you make sure that you hand in your, well, uh, put your forms on the front here as you, as you come out. And there are drinks that's for reception afterwards. So thank you.